Today at the National Press Club, the Minister for Industry and Science, Ed Husick. Among the Labor MP's top priorities are strengthening the manufacturing sector and preparing Australia for the impacts of future technologies on jobs and communities. Ed Husick with today's National Press Club address. West Pack Address. My name is Laura Tingle, I'm the club's president. Our speaker today has the unenviable tasks of trying to help Australian industry compete amid a huge energy shock, provoke a renaissance in innovative Australian investment, and make science cool after a decade when we have regularly been told by our politicians to ignore science. Just as well, Industry and Science Minister Ed Husick is so passionate about all these three causes. Would you please join me in welcoming him to speak to us today? Hello, everyone. I didn't know where that pep talk was going to go, but landed beautifully. Thank you very much, Laura, for, uh, for that and for inviting me to speak at the National Press Club. It is truly a pleasure to be with you all today. But if I may begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri uh, people and pay respects to Elders past and present and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Uh, if I can also just acknowledge a few of my colleagues, including terrific Assistant Minister Senator uh, Tim Ayres, Zanetta Masarenas is here as well, the member for Swan. Uh, that is uh, the fact that in the last week of sittings we've been able to prize them away from the hill is a miracle in itself. So everything's possible in this, this address, but thank you for your attendance today and hopefully I haven't missed any other colleagues or I've got some explaining to do. Um, I uh, wanted to start by reflecting on, on something from a few weeks ago where I caught up with Kylie Walker, the CEO of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, ATSI, and I think Kylie is here today. Um, Kylie's always got uh, new and interesting stories to tell me about what ATSI fellows are up to and she told me about uh, how up in Queensland, in the tiny town of Camelwheel, a new industry is taking root. It's First Nations owned and led, connecting thousands of years of know-how with the latest in Australian materials science. For nearly a decade now, the Dugalungi Aboriginal Corporation has been working with University of Queensland researchers, including ATSI fellow Professor Darren Martin, to turn Spinifex grass into new materials like stronger cement and recycled paper. Together, they're working to commercialise Spinifex grass for a range of industry applications and they're pushing the limits of what's possible in material science, turning microscopic fibres of Spinifex grass into materials eight times as strong as steel. In a tiny town in northwestern Queensland, barely 12 kilometres from the Northern Territory border, uh, a more natural and more sustainable basis for carbon fibre products is being cultivated. I keep thinking about the story Kylie told me because it brings together the values and ideas on which my approach to this portfolio is built. And it's a story that is uniquely Australian, forged from the harshness of our climate and the ingenuity of the people who live here, celebrating Australian skills and know-how wherever they come from, from cities and towns, regions, remote communities, fostering new kinds of partnership, not just in pursuit of economic benefit, but for the benefit of local communities, creating new jobs, jobs bridging agriculture, science and manufacturing, widening the pipeline of talent in our STEM sector, pairing First Nations knowledge with material science, and developed in pursuit of a more sustainable life for everyone. But it also left me with a question. What else do they need? Have we done all? that we can to ensure that great Australian science put to new industrial use is set up not just to survive but thrive in this country. We want Australia to be a country that makes things again. It's that simple. And it's not some out of some rose-tinted nostalgia for the old days of Australian manufacturing because in reclaiming the idea of a country that makes things, there is potential to reshape what we as a people can achieve together to reinvigorate faith in Australian ideas and know-how, to remind ourselves that we have all the ingredients we need right here, the people, their capabilities, 
natural resources, we can compete with the best in the world to produce new technologies and research. In communities around Australia, in our cities, our regions, people get why manufacturing matters. They also know how manufacturing has changed and evolved. Manufacturing is more than just smokestacks or rows of workers pumping out parts. Today, if you want to compete, you need sharp manufacturing capability. And manufacturing spans sectors as diverse as medicine, transport, computing, clean energy. Since taking on this role, I've travelled all parts of the country and I've been energised by what I see. Firms having a go, pioneering new ideas, defying doubt. It can be in Western Australia, where Glide Products is using high-grade aluminium to manufacture manual and powered wheelchairs that can easily be recycled. It could be here in the ACT, where Gatera are using native insects to break down food and organic waste, creating new proteins through to fertilisers. It could be in Queensland, where Graphene Manufacturing Group is experimenting to develop batteries that can charge, get this, 70 times faster and have three times the battery life of today's lithium batteries. All Australian companies testing the limits of what's possible with emerging technologies paving the way for a greener future. Australia's first quantum computing company, Silicon Quantum Computing, was the first company in the world to manufacture an integrated circuit at the atomic scale. For all of you who cringe at putting together IKEA furniture, just remember that. <laughs> Quantex Labs in Adelaide, building the world's most precise quantum sensors and clocks for space and defence applications. In Perth, the Pawsey Centre, uh, has announced that their Satonix supercomputer has been named the fourth greenest supercomputer in the world. And while the applications these companies create cover everything from quantum tech to modern fertilisers, from biotech to battery manufacturing, they're connected by the same spirit, a willingness to take risks, embrace new ideas, fueled by a faith that those new ideas uh, have a home here, that they can grow here. There is, in some corners of this country, an outdated view of manufacturing, a sense that manufacturing is something we did once, but don't do now. Well, that lack of faith in our ability to make things has actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right now, Australia ranks dead last among OECD countries in manufacturing self-sufficiency. We've got the smallest manufacturing industry relative to domestic purchases of any OECD country. Our consumption of manufacturing output is nearly double our domestic manufacturing output. And we've slipped in economic complexity from a modest 55 in 1995 to 91st in the world in 2020. We import the bulk of what we need across sectors and yet the signs are there that we can take a different path because despite our tendency to take what we can get from overseas instead of what we build at home, the manufacturing sector is still our seventh largest employer, directly employing nearly 900,000 skilled workers across the country. And while the pandemic demonstrated just how vulnerable our supply chains uh, have become to overseas shocks, it's also opened people's eyes to our domestic capabilities, what can be done when we need to get it done. When COVID-19 first hit our shores, we couldn't get a hold of PPE or masks, but almost overnight, we watched local companies pivot their own facilities to help plug the gaps. They were, they were visible and essential. Um, the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centres, Dr Jens Ganeneman, has observed, if we understand manufacturing as a capability that permeates every industry, we can transform Australia from a lucky country into a smart one. The pandemic showed us that luck doesn't last forever. We need to be smart too. And we're not the only country to realise this. Around the world, industry policy is being re remade before our eyes to shore up local manufacturing capabilities. And in the US, for example, President Joe Biden delivering on Made in America commitments with more than $100 billion in announced investments in electric vehicles, batteries, critical minerals, as well as nearly $80 billion in semiconductor manufacturing. In our own region, Singapore's unveiled a 10-year plan to boost manufacturing by 50%. Now, Australia can be a bystander of these changes or it can be a driver of change. Working with our partners around the world, we want to see Australia once more at the forefront 
of technological innovation and advanced manufacturing to make sure Australians benefit from our homegrown ingenuity. Australia can be a place that makes things, but it won't just happen because we declare it so. What's been missing is our preparedness to engage, invest, to act boldly, to believe, to work together across science, industry, manufacturing and every sector of the economy in pursuit of a common, more prosperous future. For Australia to boost its manufacturing output, we've got to do three things. We've got to invest in human capital, strategically invest in Australian ideas and invest in our future technological potential. This portfolio is where all those needs come together. They shape actions that this government's prioritised in its first six months and I want to briefly explain how they all fit together. First, investing in human capital. I'm going to start by taking you back 30 years to this quote. A notable Australian saying, in this national task of mobilising our human resources, our scientists and researchers stand at the forefront. Australia must reduce its reliance on imported technology and borrowed research. We must become a leader in the production and export of ideas. The person who said that, Bob Hawke. And he said it during an election campaign launch in 1990. The need for this action has spanned decades. Uh, and by the way, today marks the day in 1948 when the first Holden rolled off the assembly line way back when. So the need for this action spanned decades. Insight, his insight, was part of his appeal to the Australian people because they recognised the, the truth of it then and they know it today. Science enables new discoveries. It's the fuel for, for transformed industries, essential to economic prosperity and long-term national well-being. Our government firmly believes in the importance of science for all aspects of life. As Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said last week at the PM's Prizes for Science, investing in science is investing in our future. However, some of the greatest breakthroughs in science have come from happy accidents or repeated failures. Today, we're benefiting from years of basic research in areas that are now poised for commercialisation. Areas like quantum technologies through to synthetic biology. It's been a long-standing labour ambition to increase investment in research and development in this country. In fact, one of my predecessors, Kim Carr, tireless advocate to achieve that change, and I'm picking up that torch. Because R&D intensity in the OECD has been steadily rising. The OECD average is up to about 2.67% in 2020. Countries like Israel, Korea, Belgium have sustained particularly large growth. In contrast, Australia has been sliding down the ranks. The 2022 uh, Global Innovation Index ranks Australia as 25th most country overall, dropping from 23rd in 2020. And yet, our research capacity is very high. We ranked fifth in the world in human capital and research in that very same index. We have, clearly, the science capability. Manufacturers already some of the biggest investors in R&D. Currently, for example, the sector makes up almost 30%, 30% of the total R&D expenditure through the government's research and development tax incentive. The science ecosystem is a broad one, spanning the lab bench through to the boardroom to the factory floor. We need to support it, sustain it, from basic research at the lab bench to new industrial uses and technologies. And to this end, we've kicked off consultations to revitalise Australia's science priorities, which is being led by Chief Scientist Dr Cathy Foley and expected to be delivered by September 2023. Our refreshed priorities will complement this government's review of the Australian Research Council and the development of a universities accord, being led by my friend and colleague Jason Clare, Minister for Education. As a new government, we are quick out of the blocks to transform the conversation and the culture around skills and knowledge, industry and jobs. That, that, that's all part of the science and technology pipeline. We've got a goal of getting to 1.2 million tech-related jobs in Australia by 2030. It may sound like a high number, but remember, today there are already more software engineers and developers in Australia than there are hairdressers or solicitors. To reach that target, we're working to widen the pipeline of STEM talent from all corners of the community, the Digital and Tech Skills Compact Working Group, 
which I established with my colleague Brennan O'Connor, the Minister for Skills and Training. This is a collaboration between government, unions, technology employers that will develop pilot schemes to support workers entering the tech industry from all walks of life. We've also invested heavily to create more university places plus fee-free TAFE places across the board. And we're taking action to improve the diversity of our STEM workforce, drawing on lessons from what's working, what isn't. I've commissioned an independent review of my portfolio's diversity and STEM programs, for example, to ensure that the initiatives we have to improve the range of Australians entering are working as intended. Without properly investing in human capital, we have an impoverished science capability. And that strengthened science capability is essential to reinvigorating our manufacturing base. But for this manufacturing base to be sustained, we must provide more opportunities for Australian businesses to develop and market their products within Australia and overseas, which is why, together with my other colleague, the Minister for Finance, Katie Gallagher, we're develop, delivering the Buy Australian Plan, a significant procurement reform program. Aims to level the playing field for SMEs, regional and Indigenous owned businesses, and support the creation of new jobs, putting taxpayer dollars to work to create new work here. Investing in human capital also means supporting the next wave of Australian entrepreneurs emerging from our universities, our cities, our towns. Encouraging Australians to invest in new ideas, new businesses that could be the next big breakthrough. Imagine a future where university students are able to stay on a further year at uni to participate and work with start-up incubators and accelerators with the opportunity to translate their ideas into new, vibrant businesses. That's start-up year, a policy we want to bring to life, working with, uh, again, working with Minister Clare. Extending access to early stage capital with the support of a modified HEX scheme that may create up to 2,000 new firms and all the jobs that they generate as a result. Producing the next wave of companies, translating science into jobs and technologies of our future. New firms, new jobs, new growth. Investing in human capital is the first step. Uh, it must be partnered with investment in our industry capital. Tomorrow, I'll be introducing legislation enabling the establishment of the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund. It's a key election commitment. This, the National Reconstruction Fund is one of the largest peacetime investments in our country's manufacturing capability in living memory. It will help drive economic development in our regions and outer suburbs, boosting our sovereign capability, diversify the nation's economy, and importantly, help create secure jobs. The $15 billion fund will be governed by an independent board built on the model that Labor previously championed via the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. It'll be empowered to invest through a combination of loans, guarantees, uh, and equity, including with institutional investors, private equity, and venture capital. It will be administered on the basis that it'll achieve a return to cover borrowing costs, and uh, it'll have an expected positive underlying cash impact. Minister Gallagher and I will establish an NRF reference group shortly, made up of leading figures in industry and investment circles. The group will help divide, the, sorry, not divide, the, the group will help guide the, uh, whew, glad I didn't say that in, on TV. Um, the group will help guide the development of the NRF and its investment mandate. Now, among some in the community, there's still this rusted on sense that when it comes to industry policy, government shouldn't be picking winners. That governments should only be considered as investors of the last resort, intervening when the markets failed. What a diminished view of the role of government and a missed opportunity. Governments can and should strategically and thoughtfully invest in industries of the future. It's what our friends and allies are doing. In the United States, companies like SpaceX, SolarCity, and this little co company you may have heard of called Tesla, have thrived largely thanks to government investment. Together, those three companies received nearly five billion US dollars from the US government. When we hail the growth of industries in other parts of the world as an example of what can be done here, just know that governments do act strategically and methodically to nurture and grow those industries. And this is what we intend to achieve through the National Reconstruction Fund, 
strategic investments in priority areas. For example, value add in resources, value add in agriculture, forestry, fisheries, transport, medical science, renewables, low emissions technology, defence capabilities, and in enabling capabilities across sectors such as robotics, AI, quantum, these will all drive future economic growth. By investing in Australia, we'll have the mass and we'll have the momentum, and we're not going to let it fall away. From next week, my department will open broad public consultation to further define the scope of the seven priority areas of the economy for investment and how the fund will make investment decisions. It's important to emphasise this. The NRF will not be doing everything. It will be doing the important things. And every company that approaches the NRF will need to be prepared appropriately. They'll need a business plan. They'll need to show how they propose to build solid companies that generate a return and support the creation of secure, well-paid jobs. And there will not be a colour-coded spreadsheet in sight. <laughs> the NRF is the connective tissue between human capital and technological potential that shapes my portfolio. It's one mechanism through which we will realise our ambition to better connect science and industry to ensure Australian-made discoveries can be commercialised and scaled in our nation. I don't want scientists and researchers and innovators thinking the nation turned their back on them and that the only way to realise their dreams was to head offshore. We want more Australian companies to think globally and build locally. We have missed opportunities in the past and we're determined we don't do that again. Because remember, some of you may not be aware, Australia was once one of the world leaders in the development of a technology that transformed our lives. One of the first ever digital computers was built right here in Australia by Dr Trevor Pearcy and a team of men and women engineers. We built it, this island nation, far from those other early computing pioneers in the US and the UK. And we put this emerging technology to work in pursuit of other major projects like the Snowy Hydro. And it came out of our predecessor in the CSIRO, and I just want to acknowledge the presence of Larry Marshall here today. We cannot let opportunities slip through our fingers again. The NRF dedicates, for example, $1 billion in a critical technologies fund. It will be an important part, plank of the portfolio. There are three areas we've already identified as critical to our future. Quantum technologies, robotics and sensing technologies, and clean energy generation and storage technologies. These are already being bolstered by strategies underway within the portfolio. Quantum technologies, for example, and I notice there are representatives here from Canberra's own Quantum Brilliance, uh, will transform communications, sensing, computing and cryptography. They'll enable new manufacturing possibilities, new drug designs, new possibilities in foundational research. Updated market projections released by the CSIRA just a few weeks ago have shown that quantum technology is forecast to reach $6 billion in economic value and generate more than 19,000 jobs in Australia by 2046, or 2045, I should say. It could soon match oil and gas sectors in Australia in terms of jobs created. We have a comparative advantage in building and commercialising quantum technologies developed off the back of decades of research investment in quantum physics. We need to ensure we embed quantum capability and value here in Australia for the benefit of Australians, which is why the government's delivering the first national quantum strategy to be published in the very near future. Another important area, robotics. Um, you, you might not know this, but Australia is actually a global leader in field robotics. Robots that operate in large, unstructured outdoor domains like aerial, land and underwater robots. In 2021, Robotics companies were estimated to be worth $18 billion in annual revenue to the Australian economy, up from $12 billion in 2018. Robotics te technologies will be part of our industrial future. It's why I've committed to delivering a national robotics strategy. It's not about replacing workers. It cannot be about replacing workers. We are not racing against robots. We are racing with them to industries and jobs of the future. Manufacturers are already entwining automation with human skill to develop secure, well-paying jobs. So we've prioritised also, uh, on top of that, the development of a national battery strategy, which will ensure we take our place 
in the high value supply chains in battery manufacturing now in the times ahead. We don't want to simply extract some of the world's most valuable minerals and simply send them offshore. We can transform those minerals into value and jobs right here. If we mine it here, we should make it here. Our plan is to, develop, to deliver a domestic battery manufacturing industry that will combine Australian sourced materials and minerals, Australian know-how and Australian skills to power the clean energy transition here and around the world. Having coherent national approaches to the development and uptake of key emerging technologies are part of ensuring these technologies don't just deliver economic growth but safeguard national wellbeing. This investment in our technological potential ensures we always have one eye on the future of our industries, not just in the short term. Around this country, we have Australians defying doubt. The, the scientists, the researchers, the entrepreneurs, small business owners. From the newest of startups to the most established of manufacturers, they're dreaming big, taking risks. What's been missing in the past decade has been faith in the power and strength of Australian ideas. Here, in government. Well, from the National Reconstruction Fund to our Buy Australian Procurement Plan, from investing in skills and helping scale up new technologies like quantum and robotics, from our very early days of government, we are planning for the years ahead. Our government is laying the foundations for Australia's future prosperity and well-being, a nation that makes things here and trades them with the world. The decisions we're making today are all in pursuit of a vibrant future for science, industry, manufacturing in Australia. A future that involves Australians from all walks of life, that celebrates skills and know-how from wherever they appear. A future in which the spark of an idea, cultivated through thousands of years of First Nations knowledge and refined through the lens of material science, can become a new business, changing lives and communities. A future in which new ideas are nourished and sustained, becoming sources of heat and light for others. Some people might think my portfolio is all about the wheels and gears turning together, science, industry, manufacturing. But I see in it something of the nation's character, our smarts, our ingenuity, our defiant refusal to know our place, preferring to act and confound the doubters. We come up with big ideas. Now as a country, we've got to cultivate the courage to follow them through. We must take and make these investments in our human capital, in these big ideas, in our technological potential. It's got to all work together. The Albanese government has faith in Australian know-how, faith in our people, faith in our ability to build things here. The NRF that we, we will start to legislate tomorrow is a down payment on that faith with many more in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. This speech making is dry work. It is, it is dry work. Have a, have a good drink. Thanks for your speech, Minister. Um, uh, some of the uh, themes that you've talked about today mm -hmm. sound familiar, having covered industry ministers back to John Barton. Um, and, but the, the, the mix of them changes. I mean, mm. there was obviously a lot of focus mm. in his time on jobs and uh, you know, the, folk, the prospect of losing a lot of them yeah. in manufacturing. Uh, but there was issues of critical mass, of value adding, um, of uh, linkages between business and academia and science, um, the idea of getting the competitive gene, which hmm. might be a Keating phrase, I can't quite remember, but the idea that if you opened up the markets, you'd help uh, uh, sort of raise comp uh, competition of skills. And one of them, of course, was finance. Hmm. So I suppose my question to you is, the National Reconstruction Fund, what hole is that filling? What, what are you hearing from the sector now about its capacity to get finance at the moment for new and innovative uh, uh, projects? And how much of the National Reconstruction Fund is also about creating those linkages that we've also seen um, through the CEFC mm -hmm. um, in the way it's developed projects? Sure. sure. Well, there, there are a lot of things in there, uh, just to, to briefly uh, pick up. But if you look at where, uh, you know, it used to be the case that uh, people in my vocation, when they're looking at ministerial roles, used to shy away from the industry portfolio. 
uh, because there wasn't much hope that it did much anymore post what all those big changes that John Button did, but importantly what Paul Keating did in terms of unleashing economic capacity and, and having to go through some of that really important economic reform, uh, particularly as it came through industry assistance and protection. Um, but those reforms were the foundation for longer term economic success and that span of economic growth that the obviously the pandemic uh, interrupted that, that uh, glory run that we had. Um, but it was important to change industry and it didn't mean that manufacturing disappeared entirely, it evolved and it realised and particularly, and this is the big thing for us, uh, when I, I say that you know, there's this view that manufacturing is you know, the idea that it's all smokestacks and rows of, of workers, that capability has transformed and it has to for industry to survive and where we've got to be is at that complex end of manufacturing we see that and that's why the priority areas that, that we've listed out that will underpin, for example, the National Reconstruction Fund, it's why they will be important longer term um, because you'll see that higher skill and it's not all. Like, we shouldn't all be thinking that it's university delivered, though that skill development will be important as a pathway. It's also, also through vocational pathways as well, which is why I've made that emphasis on the investment in human capital because of the complexity of the manufacturing capability but also the automation side is important. And as much as people may think that um, I've just got this interest in the national robotics strategy because I'm the minister for nerds, it's not just that. It's because if you, when I go into a lot of factories, I'll ask people, where'd you get that, where, where'd you get that equipment from, that plant from? And they'll tell me it's either France, Italy, Germany. I was in Amazon's um, massive warehouse uh, in Kemp's Creek the other week and it's, just, it's the size of four football fields, right? And you see all this equipment, and they said they brought it in from the Netherlands. Now, are you telling me we can't compete with that in terms of our labour costs, in terms of our smarts, in terms of our capital? We can do that here and also ensure that you don't have that being transported a long, long way away, requiring the installation and the OPEX to all be done from someone offshore. It can be done here, but it can also transform manufacture. And when they're at the point to grow, and picking up on your other element of the, of the question, Laura, around what the NRF will do, there are a lot of instances where people want to be able to get support. They want patient capital, particularly deep tech investment. They want that patient capital to be there. And we're hoping that the NRF, by crowding in investment from superannuation, VC, private equity, that it'll take some of the edge of that risk off, build the investment pipeline to make sure that people have got capital when they need it, for the expansion where they've developed the idea, they've started putting people on, but now they can, uh, they can grow that further. And the NRF, we hope uh, and we aim that it will be there with that patient capital longer term to see the evolution of that capability. And it is very important, particularly at a time, if I may add, you know, we've come from pre the Delta wave where the world was awash with capital. Then we went through Delta. Then we saw central banks tighten. Then we saw the cost of capital increase. We saw what happened with supply chains. And we saw also people rethinking with the supply chain impact what they had to do to build capability here. So if there's ever been a time for the NRF to emerge, it's right now to make sure the availability of capital is there where there is a bit of tension in early stage innovators being able to get access to that capital to grow. So we're seeing it all in that, all linked in in that way. Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from The Australian, thank you for your speech. Uh, just to pivot to energy, which I know you're really excited to talk about. I did about. have little cards <laughs> and I was going to guess what the questions would be and, and put you them on my forehead. <laughs> probably um, remember that guy. Look, on the energy crisis that we are looking at, is the government looking at providing financial assistance to electricity retailers and generators, allowing them to pass on lower bills to under pressure businesses and households? Not is that going to happen? I just want to know, is it being considered? Well, thank you for the invitation for me to be suitably bold uh, in saying something after I note that our Prime Minister has expressed a number of times we're working through these issues. We're considering uh, the different elements that are required. Uh, we do recognise this is something that we, and we've said repeatedly, will need to be attended to. Um, we can't have energy prices in the trajectory that's been estimated by Treasury. Uh, we are going to have to deal with that. In my own case, I may have said a word or two about the need to bring gas prices down. Um, motivated by a realisation that industrial users make up about 
48% of domestic gas demand. So we're very fixed on this. We're working across a number of ministers uh, to make that happen. Those details, Sarah, I wish, I really wish, um, after all my yammering, if I may put it that way, for months on this issue, I, I can't tell you, I would love to be the person that tells you that, <laughs> that outcome, but I can't. So uh, if, if I may um, suggest, if it's just wait a little bit more, as the Prime Minister has said, we'll, we hope to announce that very shortly. Yeah, not on the outcome, though, is it being considered? Financial assistance at all being even just chatted about? Look, there are a lot of chats that are going on. <laughs> David. There are a lot of, there's a lot of thinking, and I do apologise, Sarah, I'm not able to give you the answers that I understand you and your colleagues are after, but, but if I may say this, one of the things I value about the way that Anthony Albanese runs this Cabinet is he allows people to, like, for a broad range of ideas to be considered, he gets people involved and in working across portfolios. We recognise we are not, this is not a government that is addicted to announcement. We've had enough of that in this country. I think there's an expectation that you all, with with the size of a problem as wicked and wretched as this is with energy prices, that we will think this through, we will use an evidence base, we'll talk with people and we'll deliver something sustainable. That is what is on our minds and it's why I'm not really, if you don't mind, at liberty to, to be able to deliver everything that is being contemplated, though we are thinking deeply about how to frame that response. David Crowe. <coughs> Thanks, Laura. David Crowe from the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age of Melbourne. Thanks mm -hmm. for your speech, Minister. Um, the NRF is $15 billion, $5 billion over the next several years. Mm -hmm. It's a massive amount of money that can be used to re-engineer companies in Australia. You have this pressing issue with energy uh, supply and price. To what extent can you use the NRF or do you want to use the NRF? Um, to encourage companies to move away from gas and to find alternative sources of energy so that manufacturing won't be so reliant on gas. You just mm. mentioned how reliant manufacturing is on gas. Mm. Can the NRF be used as a way to ease some of the pressure on those manufacturers because of the price and supply of gas? Uh, so a number of things, David. Uh, one, uh, we have within that $15 billion, a $3 billion commitment for low emissions technology for us to be able to find ways in particular, as everyone knows, you know, it's cited often. You know, our thinking, in all the solar panels that sit a quarter of the roofs of this country, our thinking was embedded within that, but the manufacturing was done elsewhere. So we do, with that technology, we not only want to think of it here, commercialise it and then manufacture, um, but we, that, that's the big thing that we want to see out of the NRF to manufacture some of this technology. So coming to the heart of your question about alternatives, so that uh, those firms have access to that technology, can put it to work quicker uh, to reduce their own carbon footprint and reduce the bill of, or the price of energy. But we just got to slow our roll a bit because um, while a lot of firms want to do this, and I've often emphasised that these firms do not want to kick this can down the road. They've got investors breathing down their neck saying, we want you to decarbonise, so the pressure is on. The issue is having the technology be able to supply at a need at a, in a way that meets their needs, one, and at a cost that is comparable. So, for example, in the development of hydrogen technologies, for instance, um, that, that's a big concern. But there are firms that are actively uh, contemplating this. The other thing, uh, David, in the consideration around this issue on gas, there are some businesses that will... Um, they're going to need gas as part of their feedstock, chemicals, plastics, for instance. So until an alternative comes up, it's going to be, be hard. But there is a desire for, um, for alternatives to be there. The gas companies have engaged in a bit of encouraging that with some active demand destruction that's been occurring with some of the prices they've deliberately offered that have been out of whack with what the local market can, can, uh, can afford and the ACCC um, has detected that and reported on it, which has been good to identify, but that's not the way to make that transition. So we do see that the fund, plus a lot of the other work that my colleague uh, Chris Bowen is doing, um, we, we do see that there is a role for joining up, and that's what we're very much focused on, all our policies where they can, to work as one to deliver even greater effect. Andrew Tillett. Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review and uh, board member here at the Press Club. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, one of the big gas users... Why did you say board member? Is that 
putting me to put me off, or is that putting pressure on me? It's just full disclosure. He is. I got the president here. Yeah, and you president. Just drop that on me. Full, full, full disclosure. Oh, sorry. We've got to be professional to, through these things, Mr. Tillett. Please, your question. Thank you, thank you Mr. Husek. Um, yeah, one of the big gas users in Australia today, Brickworks, mm -hmm. announced that they'd signed a, an 11-year supply deal with mm -hmm. Santos for gas. Um, they're going to pay a little bit more than they're paying now, yep. but they, they still say they're able to make a profit at that price. Does that um, sort of demonstrate that, that companies, rational companies, will do deals and make decisions in, in, their, in their corporate interest? And, and does it undercut the argument for um, uh, intervention in the gas market, given that, that, that companies are just getting on with it and not waiting for, for what your, the government's promising to do? The good thing is, in this room, there are people that aren't cynical <laughs> and that wouldn't think that what a great deal has just appeared right on the eve of us announcing things um, or contemplating different measures. But we're not cynical and we're not thinking that way. But I might make the, the, the point, it's great that they've come up with that deal, fantastic, and it's important particularly for a high intensity user uh, like Brickworks as a factor of their production, very important. But it's got to a like point where we have had to cajole. And just to let you know too, I mean, I've met with a lot of these firms privately. I've indicated to them why this is important to us as a, as a government to see these input costs drop. Um, I wanted to emphasise this in the earlier question you raised, Dave, David. On coming to government, I always indicated there were three uh, sources of lead in our saddlebags with our ambitions around supply chains, skills and energy. So that's why it's been a big, big factor. I think we're getting movement on the other other two, but we certainly on energy need to, to move. Been saying to them privately, you've got to move. Saying to them publicly, they've got to move. And it's not because we want them to do or engage in corporate welfare. Well, what we've been saying consistently is cost of production and a reasonable rate of return. They were making those investments when the cost of gas was way lower. It was about four to five dollars a gigajoule. So they were making profit then. But they want to be able to, in a spot market at the moment, I'm advised, I think the latest figures I got was the spot market was about $20 a gigajoule. So from four to five to $20, they've reached 10 in this deal. That's great. But does it really take us as a country to publicly cajole and browbeat them on the way in which they have priced an Australian resource for access by Australian businesses and households? And respectfully, I'd say, no, it shouldn't get to that point. We still want them to be profitable. We still want them to make a return on their investment. And what's, what's been shown is that they can do it. I mean, again, I, I just... The issue with the gas companies, if I may say, uh, has been that they'll propose nothing and oppose everything. In terms of anything we put forward, you'll see that, right? But the reality is, as a government, we're trying to get the balance right, recognising their needs to be able to operate in their way, but to not do it in a way with the pricing set that hollows out other parts of, of the economy. And we're also reflecting a strong belief in the, the views of the Australian public that we should have um, appropriately, appropriately priced and accessible Australian resources, notably gas, for the needs of industry and to make sure households get it fairly. Thank you. Andrew Probin. Minister Andrew Probin, ABC. My, my question is actually perfectly timed because it's about the about the profits. Um, Origin Energy um, told its shareholders um, that it could make a, it sort of breaks even at $3.50 a gigajoule. Um, and yet, as you, you're aware, there's a New South Wales steelmaker that was offered uh, $35 a gigajoule for mm. 12 months of gas. Given that, what justification would there be, if any, for the price cap that you eventually declare later next week? being any more than 10 bucks a gigajoule, given that that would be, in effect, a 200 to 250% profit. Well, what am I doing here, Mr Proben? You're announcing the news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've declared emphatically what's going to be occurring. Um, uh, I'm going to pay for that, aren't I, from that smart alecky on my... <laughs> I think he's entitled to a follow-up. Yep. Um, look, I, I think, Andrew, uh, I, I've... To, you know, I've had three questions where I've tried to answer rather directly uh, some of these uh, issues. I think the points that you've made and that you've cited, and I know the, the particular company 
that you're referencing that's doing some important work and particularly as a regionally based employer, it's really important that they survive. I think, again, I'm not going to um, go through the process of confirming or denying or doing any of that. We'll, we'll release those Can details. Can I the question then? In, in due course. Yeah, I did say you were up uh, for a uh, follow-up. Uh, ten, bucks, 10 bucks a gigajoule. Fair price? I think uh, we'll, we'll go through all of those details and we'll release that information in due course. But what I am saying is, uh, in terms of, you know, there'll be some deals that have been announced, like, for example, what Santos has done with Brickworks and the, the buyers, the users have indicated, if they've signed to that deal, that they're willing uh, to accept that. Um, we, we think that we've got to be able to send a clear signal that where prices have headed uh, and where they're likely to head, I think net back price for December was estimated by the ACCC at something like 30 gigajoules, uh, $30 a gigajoule. So we, we do need to attend to it, and um, we're trying to make sure we put that downward pressure on input costs, Andrew. Sarah Tonevska. Minister, thank you for your speech. Sarah Tomevska from SBS. I just want to take us somewhere else. Um, mm -hmm. With the Nationals declaring that they will oppose a voice to Parliament as a Labor frontbencher, do you think that Labor's dropped the ball in keeping momentum going on this issue? And are you concerned about how this will impact the success of a referendum? Well, just because the Nationals, with no clear detail, have decided to do something that guess what, they do really well, oppose, as they've opposed most things that are put forward before them that forward the, the prospects of the nation. I, I don't think you can read into the Nationals' knee-jerk response uh, anything wider that you would apply to this. But let me say this. You know, the voice and what has been worked on there by First Nations people has been deeply considered over a long period of time. There is a lot of detail there. And it suggests a straightforward proposition that for particularly the people that have been here for 65,000 years plus, where there was an active, we know it, we're about to have in, in, I think it's December 10, Paul Keating's, it's 30 years, I think, since Paul Keating gave his Redfin speech, one of the first um, political leaders of this country to acknowledge what had happened as a result of colonisation and what that meant that dispossession meant, and all the active steps that were taken to disconnect First Nations people from their land, stop them talking their language, stop them transmitting culture, separation of families, disconnection from their own land, all of that part. And so what we want to do is ensure just one mechanism that when we are, as a parliament, proposing things that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, that we do something called consult take on board their ideas. How many closing the gap speeches have we had from former prime ministers that recognise we need to work with First Nations communities? Um, that's been on the record for years. And when we've got a moment, a national moment, where we can work together to be able to correct that, the Nationals knee jerk reaction happens. But I think people of goodwill get that. And the other thing, if I may say, I often get people say, oh, we should confront it. People say, why are you making me feel guilty? I wasn't responsible for this. We're not making anyone feel guilty or responsible for what's happened in times past. But we're asking people to do something which a lot of Australians do well, putting themselves in the shoes of others and going, you know what? I get what you've gone through. I get what you're after. And we can support this. And I think this is something we can get together as one to correct something for years that's occurred, to do the right thing in this way, and we won't be put off just because the Nationals decided to pull one stunt one day in the last week of the parliamentary sitting. Long way to go. Thank you. Tom Connell. Tom Connell from Sky News and the Treasurer here at the club, in case we're saying that now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you did mention... Uh, I, I, look, I only want people who are on the board of the club to ask me questions. <laughs> That's it. Unlike you've raised it and I'm... Be more professional, he's it. You did uh, mention a few countries and companies you see doing well at mm. monetising tech in particular. Uh, the other thing those countries seem to have in common is 
giving subsidies or grants, which we have this R&D tax incentive approach. Mm -hmm. Instead, the indir it seems a bit more indirect, and various um, recommendations are it doesn't really work that well. Is it time to look more at grants? Because even the Reconstruction Fund has a whole lot of different funding, but not grants. Uh, I think, um, well, if I may say, there's, there is, if you look at the technology readiness levels and where a, com a, where a company evolves over time from its very start to maturation, um, there are different points at which government can make, make a difference. Um, and uh, grants do have a role, particularly for firms in their early years where they're not going to make a rate of return, but by investing in them, you could potentially transform them to, to grow and scale and get ready to go to the next level. So there is a role for grants. We've had an objection to the way that grants have been done previously. I mean, the Modern Manufacturing Initiative that the government released in October 2020, Tom, uh, we didn't oppose that. It was $1.5 billion, was supposed to be invested over four years. The bulk of it got um, spent, 85% of it, in the weeks leading up to the election. I mean, really, if we're serious about rebuilding capability, we can't have grants programs run in that way. We should have a serious, longer-term view about the role that that plays. On RDTI, can I can tell you, when I go around to firms, Tom, and they say to me, Ed, the one thing we want you to do with the RDTI is not change it. That's the one thing, because they see its value. And in manufacturing, as I said, it's important. Uh, it's an important uh, level of support for manufacturers that want to evolve and innovate. And so I, I scrupulously avoid it, if I may say, um, just avoiding as policy. I, I really, I said it to you before, I, and, and I'll say it again. I, I do not want us to be just the government of, of announcements, you know, just to rush them out because you get that, that Red Bull hit of, of media coverage, it's got to be stuff that's thought long term. So I avoided, for instance, announcing yet another review into commercialisation. I avoided announcing a review into RDTI. Um, if we do do them, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't look at them because I think your question is well placed with respect to if there's ways we can improve things, we should absolutely do them. But if we do anything, it will be, um, we, I think it's important that it be um, structured in a way that people know it's coming that it's far apart and out of election cycles, that it's run by pe decent people who've, who've had some involvement and can speak capably about their recommendations, because these investments, these changes affect companies and can affect their longer term trajectory. So, you know, th it's all this stuff that we are thinking through and, and making sure we're laying the, 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 um, uh, the rails or the tracks in an appropriate way. James Riley. Uh, Minister James Riley, Innovation Oz, uh, thanks for the speech mm -hmm. and well done for getting that NRF up. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a couple of queries about the, Just the, got to get it through the, Senate, the, the we'll get structure of the uh, disbursement. Firstly, how will you coordinate with the states or will there be any coordination at all given the states are increasingly uh, putting together their own funds for this kind of thing? Secondly, in defence, defence has a, a long history of capability development um, and sovereign capacity development. How will you either, oh, how will you, you coordinate the fund to ensure that NRF works with defence on dual use tech? Uh, and is there a NRF, a role for NRF in AUKUS, the pursuit of some of the AUKUS tech? Yeah, okay. Actually, I had, um, just to let you know, not this business card, I'll do a Larry Marshall. You've always got these things to show. This, sorry, this, it, not, not that they miss me. Um, <laughs> bit of tin. And uh, it's been, uh, that, that hole has been done by a laser. Uh, and I'm proud to say I fired it. Uh, I just missed. There was the X, <laughs> there's the hole. Um, built by a great firm, AIM Defence, a startup out of Melbourne. Um, and the reason why that they're firing lasers in industrial estates in suburban or out of suburban Melbourne is that they're working on technology that can knock out drones and providing defence capability. And they've done this on their own, out there, the pair of them, um, being able to get it... Like, if, if a politician can almost get that mark, you can imagine the accuracy, all the software that's underpinned it, all the work uh, that has been done. Great Australian businesses that should be given that opportunity, and that's why we've been thinking through with our Buy Australian plan, for example, about if we build capability through the NRF 
James, we put it, we, the intention is to put it to work through procurement reform um, and looking at how we do that. And obviously, uh, in the NRF, we've identified a priority area in defence where we can build up that capability and make sure that they've got the capital, like for AIM Defence and others that are seeking it, so that they don't have to go offshore, dilute their, their ownership. Uh, and in many instances, there have been other governments that have been prepared from offshore to back local innovation um, in the absence of finding the capital. So we do uh, need to get that right. You asked me about states. Look, I actually think a number of things. We have been consulting. We've started the consultation with states and territories. We do, I, I think at the heart of your question is right, uh, there's a concern about, well, are we off in different directions doing things? How do we um, get all that working in the same way? Um, we, we can, obviously, where we can work together, I think it is important. But states will also, and territories, make their own decisions about direction that they believe suits their jurisdiction. So where commonality, common ground can be reached, absolutely, we're starting that work uh, with them. But I also think there's a great opportunity, James, with some of the, like, you know, you mentioned other states, what they're doing, Breakthrough Victoria, for instance, um, and they're building up capability that we can see it in a way that those firms that get state or territory support as they mature get ready for support out of the NRF. One of the things that I've been thinking deeply about, whilst, you know, CFC's played a mighty role in making renewables investments a lot more attractive over its 10 years, um, it took a while to get running. Same with NAIF. And so that's one of the things that I'm thinking through, well, how do we actually accelerate the impact of that investment? Uh, and so working with states and territories is one really important part, what, pathway to make that happen, and that's what we're, we're keen to do. So I think there's opportunity as much as there is something to keep an eye on, as per your question. Julie here. Minister, thank you. Julie Hare from the Australian Financial Review and, dare I say it, a member of the National Press Club uh, on the board. Um, <laughs> Minister, you said in your speech that you wanted to increase investment in R&D to the OECD average. Um, you've said it many times before, um, Australia is now at almost a historical low. Mm. It's below 1.8%. The, the OECD average is 2.6%. You've set 2030 as the date by which you'd like us to rise to that level again. I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room would like to know when we'll see a roadmap as to how to get there because there were certainly no hints in the last budget. So when are we going to start seeing hints around that? So we, uh, I guess in some of my remarks to you all today, I wanted to emphasise in particular the value of basic research and then obviously the, translation, the translational element uh, of it as well and being make, able to make sure that those ideas that are being contemplated we can find ways to put them to, to good work. And yes, absolutely, relative to the OECD, um, uh, we are well below. I think it's 1.79% uh, of GDP. Um, it would be good to get that trajectory, but I recognise too that there are a lot of things that will need to be moved into place to make that happen. I, I do take on board your point about the last budget, but if I may say that budget was very fixed on us identifying, particularly in a climate where there are concerns around inflation and being able to drag out the amount of public spend that was there from the inherited from the previous government, there's a specific fiscal objective with what we, we've done last time. The type of things that you've raised rightly with me through that question do require thought. I don't want it to be just rushed out. So we're starting some work. We flagged, for example, the revitalisation of the national science priorities, which I want to be a ground up exercise so science and researchers can have input and we're involving the National Science and Technology Council, the PM's council, uh, in part of that work as well. We want to embed that in a national science statement and then have that, those foundation stones um, lead to how we contemplate the type of things you're asking me about, well, what's the roadmap for longer term research investment? We do need to get our act together on it. The bulk of research at the moment, as you would be well aware, because you cover the, the sector, is done within the, the universities. How do we get businesses to engage a lot more in that? And there have been some things that have been done. Again, the CSIRO, if I can refer to them, they're on programmed, is designed to get researchers thinking early on about how to commercialise some of their, their thinking uh, and to get that behavioural change early on so that they, we can then pair them up. 
some of that work needs to be potentially done uh, at scale, but I don't want to um, commit too much because I know I'll, I'll have CSIRO knocking on the door saying we've got a plan for you. Um, uh, so we'll contemplate and we'll think all that through, but it, it is, it is going to be, if I may say, and you'll rightly point out that I've studiously avoided giving you a direct answer, um, largely because it's going to be a very big issue in terms of the investment required, but also the parts that need to be moved. We've got that big lot of work being done in universities. How do we engage industry, not just big, but small, and as you would have seen some of the research that's come out, 2% of innovation and research work done, sorry, the bulk of the research work done by just 2% of firms in this country, and we've got, to, we've got to find ways to broaden that out. The last question today is from Mike Foley. Minister, thanks for your speech. Mike Foley from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Um, in September, in the, the press club here, Tesla's Robin Denholm said uh, Australia should revive its car manufacturing industry with mm. electric vehicles. Um, you've said today here that Labor isn't afraid to pick winners. Mm -hmm. um, so following on from Tom's question about grants, actually, um, mm -hmm. you know, EVs are a very prospective global market. There's only upside all around the world, of yep. course. Can Australia make cars again? Um, and is the federal government prepared to financially back that in to make it happen? Um, OK. So uh, earlier in the year, I, I visited two Tesla gigafactories in the US, uh, in Nevada and in um, Texas. Um, the one uh, in Texas is about to be built. It was, can I tell you, I, I tried to take a, a video of how big it was, and I just kept going like that with the camera. It was huge. 25,000 people in there um, building a range of vehicles. And they joined up with uh, Panasonic on, uh, and they're joining up on, uh, I think that was in Nevada where they've joined up uh, in that one, 13,000 people building vehicles, 7,000 of them in the vehicle side with Tesla, 6,000 with Panasonic. Uh, and again, it was a, a range of different skill sets uh, that were being applied and automation being used in terms of the assembly uh, as well. Um, and so I did that deliberately to get a sense of from them, and it's only one of them because there are a lot of car manufacturers that are now moving to EV, just to get a sense of what was required. And it will be something that we'd want to actively contemplate and see how we do. And transport is a priority area in the NRF. So we're not closed off to the prospect. The reason I referenced, um, Mike, the national battery strategy is because the value chain on batteries, and there's been some great work done by the Future Battery Industries CRC to look at what that value chain looks like. We know we do really well on mining, we do really well on refining. Processing, the world is grappling with how do we do that better in country. Then it's cell manufacture, integration and software, and the other big thing in all this is recycle and reuse, because those batteries, we do need to find a way to be able to reuse them and not see them all going to re, re into landfill. And so um, uh, we do need to have a much more sort of circular economy approach uh, applied to this. But the big thing, apart from EVs, if I may say to you, Mike, is energy storage systems. I mean, if we've got one of the highest rates of solar uh, penetration in terms of rooftops in this country, there is a high demand in terms of residential, commercial, industrial, to get that storage there. And as you will, would well know, um, the need to firm the grid as well, this, this will play an important role. And being able to have more of that done onshore is really important. So for example, we um, committed through the election to work with the Queensland Government on the establishment of a battery precinct in Gladstone, develop the national battery plan, call people in to be able to work on that. There are some great firms that are already well, well and truly starting to look at this, like Energy Renaissance up in the, up in the, uh, the Hunter and others. Um, and how we can scale that up is going to be really important. So to, your, to answer your question, open to EV, but it's obviously going to require us to partner up uh, with an international player on that, and there's a lot of appetite for it. But if we can also imagine a much bigger role in terms of the whole battery value chain will be really important. And we've got some good partners, if I may end on this. The US, as much as people talk about the Inflation, Reaction Act, Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, that's got some challenges because it's got a big pot of money that's attracting firms potentially to go across the Pacific. But the good thing about our friends in the US is that they do want to collaborate with people across the value chain. 
And so we do have an opportunity to work in with like-minded countries on the development of things that might have seemed too hard some time ago. So we've got some great opportunity. Please thank Ed Husick for speaking to us today. Thank you.